Hello, friends, and welcome to another presentation of Profit from Profits, where prophecy speaks and prosperity follows. That's right. Prophecy was being fulfilled in a beastly affair. A beastly affair. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the World Columbia Exposition in Chicago, USA, 1893. This was most definitely a beastly affair. It was a fair, but it was a beastly affair. Very interesting things happened during this fair, and I thought I would go over in some more detail than I went over in my previous presentation, because I think it bears some investigation to see what happened and what import that has on today. But before we get into today's lesson, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, please lead and guide as we understand the history of the world and how what happens in the past can affect our present and our future. In Christ's name, amen. Before we get started, I just want to remind you that if you want to have notifications about any new programs that come up, please hit that notification bell. Make sure to subscribe and please do send us a comment. I try to reply to as many comments as I can. Or if you have any questions, you can always contact us at our website or again, put comments in the comment section below. Give us a like. All of this helps us get noticed by the algorithms on YouTube. Okay. So the World Columbian Exposition of Chicago, USA, 1893, it was really a large, large fair. It would, I think it took about 600 acres. Uh, it uh, began in May 5th to October 31st in 1893 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus' arrival in the New World in 1492. Part of that exposition was also to show the the uh, advancement that science and technology had made during that time. And as you can see, a sketch of what the fair looked like and its expositions, but this was built in 1893. This is without any modern type of uh, construction materials. And this is what they were able to build. It was truly amazing. So we're gonna look at a few portions of the fair that I found on the internet, some, some interesting pictures. Uh, this exhibit here, and then this one over here, we'll take a look at that. And then just some pictures of, of this section over here. Truly, truly amazing. So let's take a look. So this is one of the buildings that they had. You can see the various flags of different countries because it was a World's Fair. So there, was, uh, there were different countries that were represented in some of the pavilions. But you can see the artistry and the construction was just incredible. This is a view from this building from another direction here. And then this, this waterway here that they built with the, with the obelisk, you can see this obelisk here and you can see it over here. Truly amazing. Again, different, different flags. And this is the waterway from another direction. Look at that. Isn't that something else? That's really something that they that they created. Anyways, I thought I'd show you a few of the pictures that I found on the internet. And you can find more. Uh, it's something definitely worth looking at. But what I really want to get into is the significance of this fair. The significance of this fair. So if you are able to get a copy of the 1893 Third Angel's Message by Sermons by A.T. Jones. It's in the General Conference Bulletin of 1893. You can find these online. Uh, you can find them on a PDF online. I could probably get a link uh, to the PDF at the bottom or in the, in the description. So Ellen White says this with regards to the 1893 messages that A.T. Jones give. I have been instructed to use those discourses of yours printed in the General Conference Bulletins of 1893 and 1897, which contain strong arguments regarding the validity of the testimonies, that is her writings, and which substantiate the gift of prophecy among us. I was shown that many would be helped by these articles, and especially those newly come to the faith who have not been made acquainted with our history as a people. It will be a blessing to you to read again these arguments which were of the Holy Spirit's framing. 
So the general in the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, A.T. Jones, outlines how the image of the beast is already set up in his day. And Ellen White says that of these messages, they are of the Holy Spirit's framing. That is, the arguments that Jones makes in these in these messages are of the Holy Spirit's fr framing. Now, she's not saying he's infallible, but she's saying that he was influenced by the Holy Spirit in these presentations. And as we look at the history of the World's Fair, we're going to see some very interesting things. And so I would advise and encourage my listeners to get a copy of the 1893 General Conference Bulletin and the 1897 one as well. Both are available online on PDF and I could probably get a link down at the bottom of the description where you'll be able to download them. Now, during this World Columbian Exposition in 1892, Congress, so just so shortly before it, Congress passed an act that gave five million Colombian half dollars to the World Columbian Exposition on the condition that the said exposition shall not be open to the public on the first day of the week, commonly called Sunday. That's right. Congress decided that they were going to institute a national Sunday law with respects to the opening of the fair because this was in Congress. This was at the federal level. So in the A.T. Jones report to the General Conference session, this is what he said. I will take a text tonight that will last a week at least. It is a familiar statement to all, I think. It is as follows. And he's quoting Ellen White here. The people who will now see what is soon to come upon us by what is being transacted before us will no longer trust in human inventions and will feel that the Holy Spirit must be recognized, received, and presented before the people. Now, Jones is quoting from Ellen White an appeal to our ministers and conference committee. Note what Ellen White says. She says, Seventh-day Adventists are to be a people that will understand what will occur by observing what is occurring. That is, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are to keep our eyes open. We are to see what's going on in the world. And we are not to think that things that are going on in the world are just a coincidence, are just a happenstance, that these things are not connected to the final movements of God and the devil on this earth. As we observe what occurs, we will shun human inventions, that is, human methods of working, human doctrines, counsel and advice, yes, because there's much of that in the church right now, unfortunately. This will also lead us to instead rely fully on the Holy Spirit. Remember, friends, the Bible says, A prudent man foresees the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Are you prudent or are you simple? Brethren out there, are you prudent or are you simple? Will you close your eyes to the things happening in the world today and think this is nothing there is nothing new happening. There is nothing interesting happening. There is nothing prophetic happening. Well, I would say to those that you are simple. And unfortunately, you will pass on and be punished. We cannot afford now to be foolish. We must be prudent. We must see what is happening. And we must understand through prophecy what will happen. Jones continues. Tonight, to begin with, and to lay the foundation for what is to come, we will look at the situation as it exists tonight before us in the United States government. And for this reason, I shall relate the experience of the hearing that took place lately in Washington, beginning with that, and simply state the facts as they are before us tonight, and then afterward we can find out the bearing of the facts that already exist. Now, Jones was to relate the current events in U.S. government with respects to a hearing that occurred which involved the 1893 fair. Now remember this was at the level of the federal government. 
So it wasn't the state. This was a federal government. So it, so it affected all of the United States. Jones continues, When the first movement was made for religious legislation by Congre Congress in the United States, you will remember that we began to circulate a petition which was, in effect, a remonstrance against anything of the kind containing these words to the Honorable the Senate of the United States. We, the undersigned, adult residents of the United States, 21 years of age and more, hereby respectfully but earnestly petition your honorable body not to pass any bill in regard to the observance of the Sabbath or the Lord's Day or any other religious ecclesiastical institution or rite. Now he continues, and the Sunday closing of the World's Fair, when that came up, and this is what he was really speaking about, this was likewise brought before Congress under this protest. We, the undersigned, citizens of the United States, hereby respectfully but decidedly protest against the Congress of the United States, committing the United States government to a union of religion and the state in the passage of any bill or resolution to close the World Columbian Exposition on Sunday or in any other way committing the government to a course of religious legislation. So that was the Adventist response to the legislation that had passed in Congress to close the fair on Sundays. So who instigated this legislation? Well, there was a speech by Thomas J. Morgan, he's a social democrat, as reported by A.T. Jones in the 1893 conference bulletin. He says this, I wish to say that the working men attribute the action of Congress in closing the World's Fair on Sunday to the activity and influence of the Protestant Evangelical Church. That's right. This was a Protestant Evangelical Church push that closed the fair, and that in the accomplishment of its purpose, the representatives of these churches assume to be the guardians of the economical and moral interests of the working people, and in their name and behalf, urge Congress to close the gates of the World's Fair on Sunday. So it was the evangelicals, Protestant evangelicals, that pushed for the closure of the fair. Now Jones goes on to say, that there were petitions sent out to stop the creation of Sunday legislation with respects to the closing of the fair. But although many people agreed with the fundamental principle that there should be no establishment of a religious day by the government, they said when they were given this petition, Jones reports that they were saying, I believe all that, but it is not of enough importance to pay any attention to. I would not take the time to sign my name to it, although I am in favor of all that you are saying. No such thing as that will ever be done. And because there were so many of that kind of people who did not believe that it would ever be done, it was done. Yes, friends, the warning went unheeded. Just like today, so many Protestants and regular people think that there will never come a day when Sunday laws will return and be so stringent that people will lose their jobs, their families, their homes, reputations, and lives over it. And even when you send out the petitions, and it's useless now, actually, United States, because it's already enshrined. There is no petition against Congress because Congress has enshrined Sunday as the American Sabbath. It won't be repealed. The laws will just come back. The beastly laws, the image of the beast, will speak again. But people don't think it's going to happen. I've had people on my comments say, it's not going to happen. People will fight against it. No, they won't. Just like people would have never believed that one day people could never could ever lose their jobs, families, homes, reputation, and lives over not taking the government-mandated inoculation. It's the same thing. Oh, it would never happen. It did happen. And most people caved in. Most people took it. Most people took it to save their jobs, to be with their families, to take that flight to Cancun. Because they just had to go and get some sun in the South. But they gave up their essential liberty and their bodily autonomy they gave it all up 
people will do it again. Learn the lesson. Learn the lesson. People will do it again. They will not act out of principle. They will only act out of policy. And so, friends, what was interesting was that when it was done, there was a reaction. And a reaction that created the very thing that was to be averted. Jones goes on to say that those who saw that Congress did eventually enact a Sunday closing law enshrining Sunday as the Christian day of rest by law tried to change the law. But they didn't try to overturn it on principle, that is to remove any legislation with respects to a national religious day of rest. They simply tried to change the law to be a Sunday opening law where the fair would be open to worship, but the machines were shut down. There'd be no rides, there'd be no machines moving, it would all be, everything else would be shut down. Thus, both those that strive to shut the fair and keep it open were working for the same goal, the recognition of a national religious day of rest, Sunday rest by law. And so there was a petition that was sent by uh, different groups to keep the fair open, but allow it for worship. That is, they would worship at the fair instead of have the machinery on. And so Adventists couldn't go with that petition either. We had to have our own petition that strictly asked for a removal on principle of the Sunday legislation. Adventists saw it the right way. And there was Seventh-day uh, Baptists as well. They also did a similar petition that they wanted the removal of the Sunday legislation in total, not just a change in the policy. Jones goes on to say, the Chicago Tribune, in mentioning the letter that Cardinal Gibbons wrote on the subject, introduced it in this form, in this issue of December 3, 1892. Now, look at what he reports Cardinal Gibbons as saying. There is a strong and growing sentiment in some religious circles in favor of the repeal of the World's Fair Sunday Closing Act. The possibilities for a series of religious demonstrations at the park become more and more manifest. With the leading religious and moral teachers of Europe and America to conduct services every Sunday, with sacred music produced by choruses embracing perhaps thousands of trained voices, Sunday at the World's Fair will be the grandest recognition of the Sabbath known to modern history. Look at that. The beast, the sea beast taking the advantage of the foolishness of American Protestants. Because as we will see, friends, once American Protestants give life to the image of the beast, Everyone will worship the beast, and American Protestants will be put aside. The beast will rule again. American Protestants, if you uphold this child of the papacy, this Sunday, as the Sabbath, you're going to lose everything. And remember, friends, that Protestants have no Bible support for Sunday Sabbatarianism. And Cardinal Gibbons will tell you so. Cardinal Gibbons is the same man that said, Now the scriptures alone do not contain all the truths which a Christian is bound to believe. Oh, really? Well, this is a Catholic idea, because a Catholic idea is the Bible is described as the magisterium. So the Word of God is not just the Bible in front of you, but it's also this group of men who make up their doctrines. Is not every Christian obliged to sanctify Sunday? No, we are not obliged to it. The Bible never says any such thing. This law among the most prominent of our sacred duties? But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the observance of Saturday, a day which we, the Catholic Church, never sanctify. Faith of Our Fathers, page 86. I have this book. I read that quote right there. I have it in my book. In my copy of this book. He says that. I could preach the Seventh-day Sabbath truth from a Catholic perspective because at least they know what day the Sabbath actually is, unlike Protestants 
who have forgotten and who think that they are praising the Lord Jesus and his resurrection. You are not. You are praising the beast. You are following the beast. This is what you are doing. And this is what you did, apostate, fallen Protestants. And this is why God says, come out of Babylon. Come out of you. Because you are fallen and you will not get up. You are fallen and you will not return. You are wounded and you will not heal. The cage of every unclean spirit and a very foul and hateful bird is in you. And once you again set your hand to restore the image of the beast, the union of church and state, you will have fully fallen. And you've gone back to the mother, the whore and her daughters. But it wasn't just Sunday legislation that was interesting as a result of the World's Fair. The World's Fair was also the birthplace of the interfaith movement in 1893 in Chicago, held as part of the World Columbian Exposition. On the shores of Lake Michigan, the 1893 World's Parliament of Religions marks the first formal gathering of representatives of Eastern and Western spiritual traditions. Today, the 1893 Parliament is recognized as the birthplace of the worldwide interfaith movement. This was, this was unprecedented. Completely remarkable. Never happened before in the world. Except once. At the Tower of Babel. All the world was there. And God had to stop it. God is not going to stop this movement. He's going to let it go to its fruition. Until the Tower of Babel, spiritually, is set up again. And then when God comes this time, this second time, He is not going to just confuse the language of the people. He is going to destroy and throw down this wicked tower. And friends, you don't want to be part of this. You do not want to be part of that. This interfaith movement has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. And I wonder, who opened the Parliament of World Religions on September 11? Who possibly would have opened that? Cardinal Gibbons opens the Parliament of World Religions September 11th. 1893. Well, would you look at that? Cardinal Gibbons is the one that opens it. The Catholic Cardinal, the one who said, Sunday is now the Sabbath. The one who said, Protestants, if you're following Sunday, you're not following the Bible. And Protestants flocked to this. It's so foolish what you're doing. It's so foolish what was done and what's happening today with all the Congress of Religions, the Pope meeting this religion, that religion, all these religions coming together. This is where it started. This is where it started in 1893. All these things happened in 1893. Take a look more at this, this fair. It was definitely a beastly affair because it was controlled by the beast at its heart. Yes, Protestants, evangelical Protestants were the ones that pushed for the closing on Sunday. But where did they get Sunday from? Well, Cardinal Gibbons told you where they got Sunday from. They got it from the Catholic Church. So who at heart was part of this movement? Was the head of this movement? It was none other than the Catholic Church. The beast and the false prophet giving homage to the beast. The World Parliament of Religions in 1893 also had a very interesting connection because it wasn't just East and Western thought. Okay, These were religions of the East and religions of the West. But a Theosophical Congress was held within the Greater Parliament on September 15th to the 17th and it featured some of the Theosophical Society's best lecturers. Now, if you're not familiar with the Theosophical Society, friends, then you can go ahead and take a look at them on the internet. They began 
through a lady named Helena Blavatsky. And we're going to take a look at some of the ideas and thoughts that they had. So, at this particular 1893 Congress of Road Religions, where they had the Theosophists speaking, was one of them, one of them was Swami Vivekananda. I think I said that right. Vivekananda. Yeah, Vivekananda. Ani Bazant. Now, Ani Bazant eventually took over for Helen Blavatsky. Okay, so Ani Bazant, a member of the future and future president of the Theosophical Society, established by Madame Helena Blavatsky, wrote this of this Swami's presentation at the fair. This is what she said. All was subdued to the exquisite beauty of the spiritual message which he had brought, to the sublimity of that matchless truth that is a truth without match, right? That means it supersedes the Bible. The matchless truth of the East, which is the heart and life of India. And what is that truth? The wondrous teaching of the self. The Bible teaches the wondrous teaching of God and the abdignation of the self. That is the surrendering of the self to God. That's what the Bible teaches. But the East teaches that yourself is God. That you are God. This is what she's saying. The wondrous teaching of the self. The idea that you are God. That is the matchless truth. Enraptured, the huge multitude hung upon his words. Not a syllable must be lost. Not a cadence missed. That man, a heathen, said one, as he came out of the great hall, and we send missionaries to his people. It would be more fitting that they should send missionaries to us. Well, they did. They did. And now... American Protestantism and Western Protestantism is filled with Eastern thinking. You're not Protestants anymore. You're pagans. You're pagans dressed up in Christian mockery. Is it not time to call these things out as they are? And if you're in those churches, is it not time to come out and come out now because you don't want to be associated with this? That's right, Annie Bazant. That's her, Annie Bazant. This is a picture of the, the people at the fair. And this is Helena Blavatsky, who was the founder of the Theosophical Society. In July of 1889, Bazant joined Madame Blavatsky in the Fontainebleau and witnessed the writing of the Voice of Silence. It was here that she saw the radiant astral figure of her master, Moria, for the first time, visible to her physical eyes. She wrote, now this is Annie Bazant's testimony of seeing a demonic spirit. She called it Master Moria, but it was a demonic spirit. The air was all throbbing, and it seemed as if an electric machine was playing there. The whole room was electric. I was so astonished, for it was my first experience of this kind, that I sat up in bed. At the foot of the bed, a luminous figure appeared. It was the figure of a very tall man. And, I thought, from pictures I had seen, it was Helena Blavatsky's master. Near him was another figure, that would have been Master Moria, more faintly luminous, which I could not dis clearly distinguish. The brilliant figure stood quite still, looking at me. Gradually, the figure vanished. Next day, I told Blavatsky what had happened, and she replied, Yes, Master came to see me in the night and went into your room to have a look at you. So, Ani Bazant and the Theosophical Society was present at the World Congress of Religions, which was at the World's Fair, which was opened by, which that portion, the Congress of Religions, was opened by Cardinal Gibbons, who supports Sunday Sabbatarianism, which was pushed by Protestants to create a Sunday law, the image of church and state. Protestants, Papists, and Pagans, all together, all at the fair. Yes, friends, this was a beastly affair. 
if ever there was one. Theosophy as pantheism is Satanism. Members of the Theosophical Society around the world regularly recite an invocation penned by Mrs. Bazant. She wrote, O hidden life, vibrant in every atom. O hidden light, shining in every creature. Friends, this is pantheism. This is what Kellogg believed. God is in the rocks, and God is in the trees, and God is in the water. And God is in me, and that means I'm God. No, I'm not saying that I'm God. I'm saying that that's what they're saying. O hidden love, embracing all in oneness. God does not embrace all in oneness, friends. And it is not a hidden love. God's love is not hidden. God's love is shown in Jesus Christ as spoken of in the scriptures. It's not hidden. It is open. But Jesus does not embrace, embrace all in oneness. God will eventually destroy the wicked. All are not one on this earth. There are children of the devil on this earth and they're in the churches preaching this foolishness even amongst our own people. May each who feels himself as one with thee know he is also one with every other. Recognize the same serpent language that beguiled John Harvey Kellogg, friends. Pantheism, the idea that God is in all things and that all things are eventually God. And interestingly enough, Pope Francis said in Laudato Si, everything is related, right? And we human beings are united as brothers and sisters on a wonderful pilgrimage woven together by the love, right, love, that God has for each of his creatures, and which also unites us in fond affect affection with brother sun and sister moon and brother river and mother earth because catholicism is at its core pantheism it's pantheism and this is interesting here friends because the scientific pantheist who advises pope francis on his laudato si and serves as the vatican science officer he is a pantheist he is a pantheist he believes in the gaia uh, hypothesis that of a mother earth that the earth is alive and we are part of the earth. This is what Ellen White talks about, the science falsely so-called and how science will unite with religion to enforce in Sunday law. It's all together, friends. It's all coming together in one tidy little bow. And God is going to cut that knot, I'm going to tell you. The day comes, he's going to come and he's going to cut that knot. Friends, there was a devil at the fair wasn't just a beastly affair, it was a devilish affair. So H.P. Plavatsky's influence uh, of the secret doctrine, one of the foundation texts of theosophy, contains chapters propagating an unembarrassed Satanism. The theosophical sympathy for the devil also extended to the name of their lu journal, Lucifer, and discussions conducted to it, or in it. To Blavatsky, Satan is a cultural hero akin to Prometheus, According to her reinterpretation of the Christian myth, it's not a myth, friends. The Bible is no myth. Satan is an evil, wicked deceiver. He is a hateful murderer and a consummate liar. This poor woman, as evil as she was, this poor woman took the devil's lie, and this was her this was her apostle afterward, Ani Bazant. According to her reinterpretation of the Christian myth of the fall in Genesis 3, Satan, in the shape of the serpent, brings gnosis and, liber and liberates mankind. Now, this was in Blavatsky, the Satanist, Luciferianism in theosophy and its feminist implications. That's right, because feminist feminism is informed by Satanism, and it is Satanism to have women ordained as ministers because its basis is feminism and egalitarianism, which is not in the Bible. It is not there. And the rebellious North American division and the rebellious conferences and rebellious pastors who are instituting women as pastors are participating in Luciferianism. And what does the Bible say? Because the church has voted that no woman should be ordained but the North American division and conferences continue to support women's ordination in direct rebellion 
to the world church vote under the Holy Spirit's guidance. And rebellion is what? As the sin of witchcraft. And what is witchcraft but the worship of Satan and Luciferianism? This is what's going on. These are the roots of evil. Luciferianism is in the church. It's not recognized as Luciferianism. It's only recognized as equality. Equality, diversity, inclusion. Foolishness. The foolishness of man. The foolishness of our leadership to allow this stuff in. History is telling us what's going on. History is speaking to us today. And brethren, we need to become wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We need to be prudent and see by the happenings of the past and the goings on of the present what is coming in the future. And it's coming very fast. Theosophist of 1893. So here is Annie Besant in this picture. All right. And this is a group of prominent theosophists who had attended the World's Parliament of Religions at Chicago at the World's Fair in 1893. And then there's also this gentleman here, Hivavitarama Dramapala. Now, what did this gentleman say? Well, there is a book that you can get this PDF. It's the World Congress Religions at the World Columbian Exposition. And it talks about, it has, it has many essays in here from various authors. One of them is this gentleman here. He authored a piece in this book. And this book deals with Buddhism, Shintoism, Brahmanism, Judaism, Christianity, and Mohammedanism. All right? So what did this man say what did this man say so here he is that's him as part of the author list and you can see the pages where he wrote where his article is and he says this the irresistible charm which influences the thinking world to study buddhism is the un unparalleled life of its glorified founder his teaching has found favor with everyone who has studied his history his doctrines are the embodiment of universal love. Not only are philo philologists, but even those who are prepossessed against his faith have ever found but words of praise. And he was quoting Blavatsky. So in his essay, in the World Religious Book, theosophy was being quoted in connection with Buddhism, and it's Blavatsky. He's quoting Blavatsky the Satanist. And remember at the World's Fair, the, the religious portion, the Congress, was opened by who? Cardinal Gibbons. They're all together. They were all together back then. Back then it was all happening. It was all coming together. Now this is interesting. Another one of the writers in this book, uh, with the essays with regards to the World Fair. He wrote on immortality, an argument for, and this is Reverend Philip S. Moxham of, of Boston, Doctor of Divinity, right? So what did this man say? The argument for immortality presents at its first, if not its weightest, consideration the fact that the belief in the survival of the soul after death is well nigh universal so intimately are these two ideas related the idea of god and the idea of the the pre-durable soul that it is not surprising to find them held coexistively by mankind so what were they preaching well immortality of the soul i wonder did the spirit of prophecy ever say there was a time when Immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness pushed by Protestants would connect them to to the Catholics and then the Catholics also since would connect both of them to spiritism. Yes, I think she did say something like that, didn't she? Now, was this whole 
World's Fair, and Congress of World Religions. Was it a force for good? Bishop Keane said of the meetings, Such an assemblage of intellect, intelligent and conscientious men, presenting their religious convictions without minimizing, without acrimony, without controversy, with love. Again, this whole idea of love, this universal love, this principle of love. This isn't love, it's Satanism. People say love is love. Love is not love. God is love, and God defines what love is. Sunday sacredness is not love. It's witchcraft. And truth and humility will be an honorable event in the history of religion and cannot fail to accomplish much good. Well, it should be noted, friends, that union of Protestantism with paganism will do the Catholic Church no harm but will only weaken America as a Republican and Protestant nation. So what was our Adventist response? Well, how did we respond to these, these things at the World Fair? Did those who are now hand in glove with the papacy, apologizing for its false doctrines and wicked practices, realize that the message of Revelation 18, 1-4 is now going to the world? They would start back with horror at the thought of afflicting with, or of, of affiliating with the Roman Church in any manner or form. How strange is the transition that is taking place before our eyes? Who would have believed 50 years ago that the Parliament of Religions could ever become an accomplished fact as if it had been in our day? Conciliation is the favorite topic of the hour. Wherever we go, wherever you go, the very air is full of it. Think of a Roman cardinal and Roman archbishop speaking and exchanging congratulations on the same platform with Protestant doctors of divinity in the presence of thousands of both Catholics and Protestants shouting themselves hoarse at the spectacle of this loving demonstration. Rome, for a few years, has been in desperate strait. Her temporal power gone, she is no longer able to intrigue with nations as formerly. She feels her loss and is determined to win back her political authority. She cannot do this by force. And so she tries strategy. This was in the Review and Herald, February 20th, 1894. This was a, an, Adventist, an Adventist document, an Adventist paper. Do you think that would be ad, written in an Adventist paper today? No. No, it would not. Do you think the Review and Herald is going to print courageous things like that anymore? Highly doubtful. Because the organs of the church, friends, the organs of the church have been absconded by cowards, weaklings, traitors, and fools. And very little of what comes out of our publications is any better than the common material that comes out of apostate Protestantism. Now, the ultimate goal of Rome's strategy. What is the ultimate goal of Rome's strategy? Lest anyone accuse Catholicism of having softened, they should listen to the words of Pope Leo here. In, in Longinqua Oceani, Pope Leo praised American liberty and the freedom of the United States accorded the Catholic Church. But with this praise came a warning. It would be very erroneous, that is wrong, to draw the conclusion that in America is to be sought the type of the most desirable status of the church. So he said, he said, Leo praised American liberty for the freedom of the Catholic Church, but that's not what we really want. We don't just want freedom because it says here, or that it would be universally lawful or expedient for the state and church to be, as in America, dissevered and divorced. The popes don't want the church divorced from the state. Of course, they want the church to control the state, and, Catholic, and, and evangelicals are going to help them do it. Evangelicals, foolish as they are, supporting the child of the papacy, reaching their hands across the gulf to the papacy, reaching their hands across the gulf to paganism, are, then for, are therefore going to support the papacy in what they're doing and uplifting Sunday. And they did it. They did it in 1892. 
pushing Congress to create a Sunday law. That's right. A union of church and state. An image of the beast. Now Jones said on this matter, Now, when that world's Congress of Religion comes, and from this day forward and everything that comes up, we may expect only the further development of the image that is already made. Remember, Jones, as Jones said, the image was already made. Ellen White said that Jones, uh, Jones' arguments were arguments framed by the Holy Spirit. And remember what Ellen White said. This material that Jones is talking about in the 1893 and 1897 General Conference bulletins will help those new in the faith to understand our history. Friends, this is part of our history. This fair, this fair, what happened here is part of our history. We didn't do it. But this was a fulfillment of prophecy. All that we can look for now is just simply that in each step and in everything that is done, other features will be developed which more perfectly fill out the living, standing, full image of the beast. Because the image of the beast came, but it was going to grow. It was going to happen over time. And God allowed this to give God's people time to see what was in it. To see that this holds the principles of Antichrist. And anything that holds the principles of Antichrist must be refused. Because if you begin to think like Antichrist and take the spirit of Antichrist, you're going to worship Antichrist. And you might think, these, these Congress of Religions, what a great idea. Ecumenical movement, what a great idea. Satanism, Luciferianism, the worship of the self. Some people think they're kinder than God. People think they're, they're more loving than Jesus. They're more patient than Christ. They're more merciful than the Father in heaven. Jesus Christ destroyed a whole, nearly a whole race in the flood because they were filled with evil. He sent fire out of heaven to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And people are going to flirt and dilly-dally with pagans and Romanists and apostate Protestants. You think you're kinder than God. You think you're sweeter than Christ. Well, what you eat is going to make bitter in your belly, I'll tell you that. Yes, friends, Protestants are going to lose out. So Jones goes on to relate that this church congress, this World's Fair Auxiliary that was dedicated at the dedication ceremonies, Archbishop Ireland was the grand magnet. Who was it? An archbishop. Again, Catholicism. So Protestants pushed for this. It wasn't Catholics. It was Protestants that pushed for this World's Fair. American evangelicals pushed for it. And then who gets the who gets the uh, accolades and who gets the positions of inaugurating the fair? It's Catholics. So Protestants understand you might get that law put in. You might get that Sunday law enforced. And then you're going to be put aside because the Catholics are going to step right in. And it was opened with the sanction and blessing and goodwill of the Catholic Church. The Catholics, by the prominence that was given them, simply compelled these same Protestant ministers to say, well, if the Catholics are going to run the whole thing, we will not be there. They spent all this time, these Protestants spent all that time and energy, petition after petition, to push this into Congress. Once Congress does it, then it turns around and it bites them in the face. And then they go whining away. Because they lost. You propped up the child of the papacy. It's the beast that gets worshipped. Not the ones who set up the image of the beast. The world wonders after the beast. It worships the beast. You're going to be set aside. They're not going to worship you. They're not going to praise the Protestants. They're going to praise the beast. Because they're going to say, who can make war with the beast? Because you just propped up the beast. Do you see the history, friends? And you see what's going to happen again. Protestants leave in a huff. Jones says con controversies will arise. And as soon as the Catholics begin to launch ahead a little and show their strength, the professed Protestants will resent it. We may expect that at any time. We may look for it to come from any direction and from almost any source. It will certainly come. And as a matter of fact, it has already started. When the World's Fair buildings were dedicated, the Catholics, Cardinal Gibbons, 
Remember him, Cardinal Gibbons, the one who opened the World's Fair, the one who told Protestants that they're being foolish because they're following Sunday, not the true Sabbath day, which is in the Bible. So Cardinal Gibbons and the representative of the Pope there received great honors. Was it Protestant that received the honors? No, it was the Catholics. And because of that, quite a number of professed Protestants, the preachers, got into a great huff about it. Oh, look at that. The, the daughters are whining in the corner because mama's come back. Rome fills the vacuum, friends. Jones says they, the Protestants, said that they would not have anything to do with the fair anymore. They declared if the Catholics are to have precedence and they are to receive the honors and all this, why, we'll just simply not have anything more to do with the fair. But it's too late by then. You've already instituted the papacy in the Sunday law. And now they have the power and they don't need you anymore. You're going to get tossed away like a dirty rag. Well, the Catholics don't care for that. They have got the honor and they will have the power. And if Protestants don't like it, all they need to do is stay away. Catholics will have the last laugh. Jones says, and by their staying away, they will give Catholics that much more to do what they wanted to do in the first place. So the sum of the matter is that if they stay away, that gives the Catholics that much more power. If they go, that is if they go to the fair and worship on the Sunday, it is a recognition of the Catholic supremacy and thus they are taken captive and all they can do is to be moved about moved about by that power at its will. That's all they can do. That's all you'll be able to do, Kenneth Copeland and modern Protestants who are kissing the ring of this man. You're going to be moved about by his power and his will. And all your screaming and crying and blowing the Spirit of the Lord. It's not going to do anything. Fools. You fools and blind. You fools and blind. Now is the time to come out. Learn history. Go back to history. See what it says. Investigate this. Look at this. Read the 1893 General Conference Bulletin, A.T. Jones Sermons. Read it. Get it. Get it in print if you can. It's time to get those books in print, brethren, because who knows what they're going to do to remove the truth from the Internet. Don't think they're not going to do it. It's going to go down the digital memory hole. Or, even worse, they'll change it. Get it in print. Catholics will have the last laugh, but it's really the devil. Now, Jones says this. There is just one thing that these Protestants can do. They can escape the whole thing and be delivered from it if they will. But the only way they can do it is to accept the third angel's message. There is no other way out for you Protestants and for you Catholics and for those who are not Protestant or Catholic, you'll see it too. There will be people of various faiths that will finally see and understand what has really been going on in this world. And the only way to escape following the beast is to accept the third angel's message, keeping the commandments of God, the true Sabbath of the Lord, keeping the commandments of God and having the faith of Jesus to hold on during the worldwide conglomeration of evil. These men, many of them, have been led into this by not seeing what is in it. They have been led into this by the influence of ministers who have a higher standing than they in the denominations around the world, around about, never dreaming what was in it. You see, they pushed the Sunday law not understanding what was in it. They didn't know what they were doing, but what they did was wrong. And when having done it, it's too late. The Catholics know what's in it. They know full well what's in it. But the Protestants, they don't want to believe it. They think they're honoring Christ. You're not honoring Christ. You're honoring the beast, which is honoring the devil. The only way out 
is the third angel's message. You have to become a member of the remnant. Come out of Babylon. When they see that they are caught in a perfect labyrinth, and the, few, and the further they go in it, and whichever they turn, they get lost. When they see that and how completely they have allowed themselves to be sold, they will deliver themselves by fleeing unto God. Now, when God lifts up, lifts us up, his people, his Seventh-day Adventist people, and sets us up on a high mountain, as it were, and causes his light to radiate in every direction, then the people in every direction will see it. And when they find that they are so badly lost where they are, they will be glad to get deliverance from any source. They will be glad to see that it is God that will deliver in this direction. And they would rather have God than the papacy, even if they have to come to the Seventh-day Adventist to find him, they will do it. During the World's Fair, friends, Congress instituted Sunday as a Christian Sabbath. The image of the beast was set up. Protestant, Catholics, and heathens united in a congress of brotherly love. The only way out is the three angels' message. We were warned of this. We were warned of this. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. This is a process. It's a process. The image was set up, but that image has to grow. And then eventually it'll speak. When the Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf and grasp the hand of the Roman power, did it happen? Yes, it did. Was there a decree enforcing the institution of the papacy? Yes, there was. When she shall reach over the abyss to clasp the hands with spiritualism, did that happen? Yes, it did. When, under the influence of this threefold union, was it a threefold union? Yes, it was. Our country shall repudiate every principle of the Constitution as a Protestant and Republican government and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Was provision made for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions? Yes, it was. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. This is what happened at the 1893 World's Fair. The game is set, friends. The image needs only to speak. We don't need to look for a Sunday law. It's already here. But it'll be the growth of that law in various forms. And don't think Satan is not going to mix in paganism. Green Sabbath? I think so. I think so. Green Sabbath will appeal to atheists. It'll appeal to apostate Protestants. It'll appeal to Catholics. It'll appeal to pagans. It appeals to Hollywood. It appeals to the general public. Green Sabbath? I think so. It might take a form different than we thought. But we need to be people that do what? Are aware of what will come by what is happening before us. What is being transacted before us. We need to keep our minds on the truth of God's word. We need to learn history. We need to learn history. It will help us to understand the world events. Yes, friends, this was most definitely a beastly affair. A beastly affair. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I want to thank you for the books that I found, for the, the links that I found, for the things that you've led me to find. And I pray this presentation would be useful to our brethren to help them understand the past so that we can grasp the present and see the future through the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Bless the people today, Lord Jesus, that have listened to this presentation. May it give them strength. May it give them hope. And may it give them warning to not be part of of the beast to not have anything to do with this affair. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, thank you for spending time with us today. And we'll see you again 
next time. And remember what the Bible says? Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe in his prophets, so shall you prosper. All right, we'll see you again. Bye now. Thank you.